Hey there, fellow social distancers. I'm Pruitt and this is Jim Davis. And today we are gonna come to you with tales from the before time when folks would gather around a table and have different roles. You would have the chronicler or the mapper or the treasurer. It's player roles in your tabletop gaming here on WebDM. Okay, Jim. Let's have a conversation about player roles. Yes, this is a role-playing game, so... Not character roles. Not character roles, no. Why do you think it's important to discuss player roles? Number one, they exist. You know, mm -hmm. they, and, and a lot of times they're unspoken. They're sort of like, uh, players will sort of ease into them. The classic one is like the treasurer. The person who just like keeps track of all the stuff that the party has, how much gold they've acquired or accumulated, that kind of thing. But there are others, uh, other roles that I find either explicit in the rules, particularly in prior editions of D&D. These are the kinds of metagame roles that a player can take that still have a function within the game. And some of them have parallels to like what the characters might be doing. Like a treasurer literally might be the character holds the whatever, you know, takes care of the Who has the party the fund holding. in their, yeah. yeah, in their bag folding, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. Or it could just be that this other character has it, but that player doesn't want to deal with it, but this player does. And so we just sort of muddle along until we, until it works out. But then yeah. there are other One is roles. the bank, the other is the banker. Yeah. Right, yeah, the mule. <laughs> like yeah. Uh, but then there are others that don't really have an, uh, a parallel in the game world, but they are clearly uh, player roles that they could take. The best example of this would be the rules lawyer in, mm -hmm. in, in, in a non-pejorative sense, right? The someone who's like, okay, DM's doing plenty of other things. This is the player we've designated to look up rules. These used to be explicit, right? The caller, the mapper, where they had clear game functions. They were tied directly with the, the core gameplay loop. Mm -hmm. And I think as like D&D has grown and changed and the focus of it has shifted from pure dungeon crawling to dungeon crawling plus everything else, those roles become less vital. And also like the culture of the, the game has changed. Like I remember the first time I saw anything about say the caller, for instance, I was just like, no, I was like, hell no. <laughs> One player is not going to speak for me at all. Like, I, yeah, you know, I don't know what they're, I don't know what Gary's on about. And then I started playing in groups that had upwards of a dozen or more players. And you're like, Oh yeah, only yeah. one person needs to talk to the DM. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah like, we need we need a player pope. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I find that the the player roles are either something that like say one player can handle. They don't mind doing say the bookkeeping on encumbrance, for instance, or how much food the party really has if that's what the DM cares about, and they don't mind. Like I'm one of those players where I don't I don't care. I'll keep track of everybody's stuff uh, in that sense, um, just because it's fun mm -hmm. for me. In that sense, a player role can. You can help other players enjoy the game by taking on something that they find, you know, odious. Don't worry about how much XP you got. I'll keep track of the XP since we all get the same amount. You just ask me how much we have. The other thing is like, it's a backup for the DM. You know, something that like the DM could be doing this, but it's not necessarily exclusively in the, the wheelhouse of the DM. Like there's nothing wrong with the player doing it. Keeping track of things, just like the chronicler, somebody that just has a record of what's going on. And mm -hmm. and especially it's like if the DM's doing that themselves and the player's doing it, oh yeah, the DM totally forgot about this interaction, but the player didn't, they wrote it down. Uh, same with like NPC names, especially if the DM's coming up with them on the fly and they forget to write them down or something like that. Yeah, that does happen a lot. <laughs> it does. The third thing, and this is the biggest one that I find is like these player roles can alleviate or address some points of friction that sometimes happen in, in RPG sessions. And they almost always happen because the entire party has decision-making power. Every player wants to do something different. Every player has a different idea of how they should approach a certain situation. There's a lot of open-endedness, a lot of deliberation that goes on. This is kind of the classic example. Having a player role, having someone who is at the table and it's like, all right, my job is to get us into consensus present that information to the DM and make sure that everybody's voices was heard because in one of those, as a DM in those situations, it's very easy to lose track of what's being proposed. What are we actually going to do? Mm -hmm. And in my experience, this is where a lot of the, um, I didn't mean to do that or my player wouldn't have situations kind of come up. All right. We're 30 minutes into figuring out how you guys want to walk through this room. And yeah, and six I've, people are all I've, piled I've, around <laughs> one door. Like, yes. 
<laughs> and I, as the DM, am impatient and ready to move on. And clearly some of the players are. They're tapping their pencils, checking out, looking at their phones, wandering away from the table. But in that impatience, I might rush past things. And there might be something that's very important to the party that I think is trivial because they haven't communicated it to me in, in that way. This is a good place to start, I think. Caller is what we're talking about in this. Oh, yeah. And, um, Not necessarily the party leader. Because that's, that's the character role. But yep. as the player at the table, having mm -hmm. that person be the sheepdog to wrangle yes. all the sheep. Or yeah. <laughs> the cat herder. It's not that the caller is making decisions for the entire party and saying, uh, yeah, your opinion doesn't matter. We're doing this thing. That's a bad caller. The caller's job is to listen to every player, synthesize what they want to do, and then present that information as one coherent thought to the mm -hmm. dungeon master. Our thief's over here doing this. Fighters are keeping watch at these places in the room. Wizard's reading this thing. This is what we're doing for our next 10 minutes. It can really avoid those situations where analysis paralysis and too much decision making stalls a game out. Oh yeah. And sometimes it happens sort of naturally. It'll just sort of arise. There'll be one or two players who are, are comfortable taking the lead, are comfortable going, okay guys, this is what we've proposed. Are we sure we're all doing that? Okay, DM, this is what we're doing. If the caller says, we're doing this and no one goes, wait a minute, I wanted to do this. You can really speed things along. Pacing becomes less of an issue. Those moments where some of the parties checked out and, and some of them are really engaged in making sure their one point of view is heard, smooths all that out. And you need a mature, uh, you know, listener who is capable of being the caller, someone who can both, um, you know, hear what other people are saying, make sure that they get clarification on what's exactly uh, going mm -hmm. on, and then also communicating that clearly to the dungeon master. So basically, whichever of your friends is a server. Right, <laughs> exactly. Hear the whole table, uh -huh. synthesize that information, pass along to the chef. If you're approaching 10 or more players, like, oh yeah, it'll really smooth things out. Uh, it might be different. It might be something that the players need to get used to. And that does not mean that a player cannot directly address the DM a non the non caller and go like hey what's right. going on with this it's just that it cuts down on the everybody's talking where you know it's a, the dm's trying to carry on two separate conversations with two different individuals plus deal with their own stuff by having someone that the dm can go like tell me what to do when you guys are ready then the dm can like take that time to completely ignore what's going on Right. They can completely tune out the players, focus on what they need to get ready for the next step. And then when the players are ready to present one thought, one action, one plan to the DM, he can give it or she can give it their entire attention. That's where I find the real benefit of the caller is. And if you know you want to be a caller, if you know you want to, to use it, you know, use that party role, then you can also like work that into your character. Maybe they're high charisma. Maybe yeah. they're the party face or the party leader or something like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they're a baller. So they're a shot caller. Absolutely. <laughs> they really they are the shock. They have call. twenty inch blades from which they killed an Impala. <laughs> in which they um, in which they dual wield. You're gonna go adventure, you're gonna go get that loot, and as we all know, cash rules everything around us. Certainly. So you gotta have a treasure to keep up with all that cream. Having a treasure, someone who, when the loot is rolled up, which to me is still one of my favorite parts of D&D, thinking about like when you yes. get to the end, you're like, you found your treasure hoard, mm -hmm. and then the DM starts going, all right, I need rolls. Yeah. Everybody at the party or at the table starts rolling up the treasure, but you have to have that one person to get it all down. Like in our current game, I'm the treasurer and I'm also the note taker. Uh, yes, I find I make I take voracious notes whenever I'm a player because it's how I pay attention. Like if I didn't uh, take notes, I would I would not be able to pay attention. Yeah. Same here. Okay, so number one, you're absolutely right. Like rolling up treasure at the table at the time is one of my favorite parts of D and D. It's why I don't like wish lists for treasure. I don't like I don't necessarily like creating every treasure. Uh, package or, or instance of it ahead of time. Really do like, all right, mm -hmm. guys, break out your D100s. Let's see mm -hmm. what you got. Having someone who just writes it all down, make sure that it's present, you know, that, that they can pass it around to the, the rest of the players, however they want to divide it up. Because again, the dungeon master is doing something else. Right, if the dungeon master is looking up things on a chart, uh, reading what a magic item does to decide, do I really want to let this into my game? Especially if you're rolling it up at the time. Um, you know, there's plenty of times we'll be like, nope, we're not doing that roll again. If I'm also having to like write things down and, and keep track of all that, then I'm more likely to lose track of something ironically. Mm -hmm. And so having someone else, I can just say, write this down. That frees me up to think of other things, to consider other things and, and to devote my attention and, and uh, energy towards what I think is more important. Um, it also like <laughs> keeps the party honest, I guess, but not just honest, but 
it reminds them of what they have. Like one of the things that I see a, a, particularly a quartermaster doing is just occasionally going, okay, guys, we've been carrying around these scrolls, wands, potions, what have you for two or three adventures now. Nobody's used them. Reminder, we've got these potion scrolls, wands, whatever available. Whatever happened to that one sword that I got rid of when I updated, you know, upgraded to my plus two or whatever, like, can we give that to somebody? Can we use it as a bribe? Can we, oh yeah, the, well, nope, nope. We gave it away, you know, four adventures ago to someone else. Yeah. Sorry, you weren't here that day. Somebody that keeps track of the loot. It's like a party fund or how much everybody has individually. Um, that's what I find as a player, I find the, the most value of a treasurer in is just to go, I only have X amount of gold. Is that right? Should we have more? It's very valuable. And also something that seems to arise organically from, uh, from player dynamics and sort of like the way the party, uh, you know, relates to each other. I blame it on the fact that my father's an accountant, so it's in my <laughs> DNA. So I'm just, there must be an accounting. The quartermaster and the treasurer also has this really cool parallel to the game world because it's like somebody has to physically carry around all this stuff whether it's in a bag of holding or a wagon or a locked chest or whatever there's something kind of fun about like this guy's in charge of our physical gold it's not money it's not fiat currency it's not a number on a bank account it's heavy dense mineral it's gold right it's silver <laughs> yeah. it's yeah. it is it's a physical thing it's real and because of that it exists in the game world there's one thing to just have it written as a number on your character sheet you're like geez where am i carrying around all these thousands of coins that weigh a 10 to a pound it really brings it to life it also means it's something that the dungeon master can steal and mess with so mm -hmm. having someone who keeps track of it all and makes sure that it's all you know accounted for it could be a double-edged sword but more often than not, it's a benefit. No, Starward Bound, I went after Kiana's character more than a few times, uh, the Warforged, because they had a bag of holding put in their chest. Oh yeah. And that's where they kept all the stuff. Like, <laughs> and so it's yeah. like, yeah, put it with the put it with the barbarian <laughs> <laughs> Warforged. Yeah. It'll be safe. Like it will be actually. It will actually be really safe. And, and like I said, related to that is the quartermaster. And so if you know, mm -hmm. if you have a dungeon master who's running a game where resource management is really important, where you're tracking rations and water and yeah. all that stuff that people are like, it's boring, I hate to do it. Except like that's kind so of how some parts of the game work and if you cut it out yeah. does it make that part of the game work come on this is the oregon trail son yeah exactly right it's largely <laughs> wilderness exploration where those kind of resources come into play like i've only got two weeks worth of rations that means i can only go a week's distance before mm -hmm. i need to turn back and get more food or try to hunt and like i don't see those elements as boring or unnecessary or tangential to the rpg experience i actually find them vital because they create moments of tension of of mm -hmm. uncertainty and and having to make a choice but I understand that not everybody wants to keep track of all that. So someone who goes yeah. like, I'm fine. You guys don't worry about it. I'll keep track of it. I'll keep track of the encumbrance. I'll keep track of all this other stuff. That's me. I love doing that shit. How much does a gallon of water weigh? How much do we need? We're bringing mules and other things along. Do they need to eat? Quickly, <laughs> your D&D &D sessions become expeditions. They're not like a band of plucky adventurers. They are, you know, 30 people with a bunch of mules and horses and wagons. And I like that. Like, I, that's, to me, I, I really like that kind of game. So I don't mind yeah, being a master. It starts to become exponential the second you add your first mule. Yes, it does. You feed the mule. <laughs> you need a wagon. You need... And, you gotta, and you have to have somebody to take care of the mule. And then you got to feed that person. Yep. And, you know, you got to yeah. guard the food. Yeah, know? and it differentiates between those parties that can live off the land and those that, that can't, you know, it, it, it creates distinctions and choices for the players, but it's also onerous to a lot of players. They didn't show up to do accounting, <laughs> you know, they showed up to kick ass and kick down doors and stuff. But like I said, for me, because I think it's so important and because I enjoy keeping track of it, like I can tell you where all the gear on my characters are. I, I just know. I can tell you how much they're carrying. That's important to me. And so as a player, I don't mind taking care of that for other players. I don't mind going like, yeah, don't worry about it. I keep track of it. You keep track of your own personal stuff, right? Like your weapons and armor and things like that. But the communal things, the things the party shares, I don't mind doing that at all. I mean, then you're taking something off the other player's hands and keeping it in the game so the dungeon master can make use of it. Oh yeah, because there's there's nothing like uh, everyone forgetting their their grappling hook or their <laughs> whatever it is, cli you know, <laughs> pitons for climbing. Uh, yeah. But luckily you have that person at the table's like, nope, that's in our communal bag of holding. Uh, we're, yeah. we're good. Let me, hang on, let me check my notes. Oh, oh. right, that's a segue into the chronicler. Ooh, the note taker. Nice. The note taker. 
the historian. He's the backup for the DM. Yeah, and, and the sort of like the, serves as the memory for the party. You know, not everybody's like us who takes notes to engage with the game, to stay focused and present in it. For a lot of people, it takes them out. They don't want to have to be writing and listening and everything at the same time. They want to focus on immersion or you know, staying in the moment of the of, of the the you know the encounter or whatever. The chronicler is there to go. That's this that's this NPC's name. Or we found this one object that we never followed up on. Uh, which I find is the most vital thing for a chronicler is like keeping track of the loose ends. Oh yeah, the side quests. As a player, you will certainly forget about them. You know, to me, it's like the bread and butter of being a DM, is keeping track of your loose ends. But it's not necessarily the job of the DM to go like, oh yeah, you guys totally forgot about that thing from a while back. Um, if only because that's sort of the player's responsibility to remember those things, act on them, whatever. Now, mm -hmm. if somebody asks me and I'm a DM, I might. Uh, share that but having a player who is keeping track of all those things to me is a more satisfying experience both as a player and a dm because there's not that weird break of like having to jump out of the game and go oh dm whatever happened to this one thing from five six seven however many months ago you know you can instead look at the look to your fellow player and now you're having an in-character conversation yep about an in-character thing you don't have to like step outside of the game for that like i find wizards uh knowledge clerics that kind of thing uh lord bard mm -hmm. <laughs> lord bard are good as like parallels to that if you uh if you want to to tie that into something the characters are doing i love taking notes no matter what character i'm playing i because for me it becomes a, an exercise in in the note taking like how do i want to do it do i want to do first person like this is what they're doing in the moment, or mm -hmm. this is, is this them writing it after the fact, like Bilbo and his adventures, depending on the tense that you want to use. Like, I, I don't know, to me, I, I find that uh, it helps me play my character better. Because if I really like a character and I want to be optimistic, I will write it as if it's past tense. Yeah. As if I've already at the end and this is my recollection. My Your memoirs. That, yeah, my memoirs. Yeah. The thing that can't be understated is DMs do a lot of work on these games and these sessions and these NPCs and having someone that will actually be there to make note of these places, these NPCs, mm -hmm. and actually be like, oh, you, it's this guy, uh, you, you met him before. It's like, oh yeah, I met him at the whatever town. He was the guy that yep. did this. As a DM, when your players remember those NPCs and actually remember the names, for me, it's my little Grinch heart, like just expands you know, three sizes. Yeah, uh, because for the most, you know, you know how it is, Jim. Yes. A lot of times you're like introduce all these NPCs and like, oh yeah, Slippy, Slappy, Swaz, Swanson. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, they won't remember unless it's like a really weird name. And, and of course, the the meme of oh yeah, this throwaway random NPC I just came up with, the players uh -huh. now have adopted and and made a special home for and things like that. Yeah. So <laughs> there is it's a lot good for them to keep up with it. <laughs> it's like they yeah. keep track of it by writing something and creating notes for something, especially that if it also exists in the in the game world, if it's like you're playing a chronicler as a character who keeps notes who at the end of every day busts out their quill and pen and, and parchment and starts like keeping a diary or something then it's like you're further blurring those lines between player and character that i really like <laughs> really, oh yeah you know? it, in similar way that like treasurer and quartermaster are, are roles that players can have like there's the chronicler but then you also have the npc tracker which is like a more specialized like the chronicle is like what we did where we went what happened the npc tracker can be just like all right this is who this is this is their relationship to us this is where we last left mm -hmm. off with them if, if there's some if a request or something that they've given us, you know, here's where it is, especially in like big games with like a lot of NPCs, a lot of just stuff going on. Uh, urban campaigns tend to take on this mm -hmm. character just because it's like there are so many NPCs you might meet. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a varies almost. Right. Like a master of whispers who knows who everybody's, what everybody's doing, where they went, yeah. who's the, what they said. What they said, uh, yeah. Keep track of them. Maybe they're the party face. If you're running a game where social interaction is really important, uh, you're running a game where like leveraging those relationships for your own goals, uh, discovering secrets, using the you know, blackmailing, <laughs> you know, NPCs with those secrets, just keeping track of it all uh, can be a daunting task and is one of, I think, like the biggest hurdles that I've noticed from players with those kinds of like intrigue heavy games. Who was that? Did, you know, did, was it the same person as this other guy? Like, oh, I wasn't here that day. Who are we talking about? Or what usually mm -hmm. will happen to me is like, I think we're talking about two separate NPCs. We're really talking about one. And yeah. so <laughs> having a resource that the party has access 
access to uh, other than the DM can be really helpful. And like, you can also keep track of it online so everybody can see it, share it, look at it between mm -hmm. sessions, that kind of thing. And the cousin to the, uh, the, the Chronicler and the NPC tracker, the mapper. Yes. <laughs> I mean, everybody loves a good map and I don't know that I've ever seen a map actually look like what it's supposed to look like at first oh well that's just uh that's just a uh, uh, you don't need to worry about that like if if your part <laughs> if your if your map looks different than the dm's map that's fine uh the map is not the territory in that sense but having something that lets you the player know where you are at where you've gone what paths you haven't taken um mm -hmm. it, you know where the chronicler is like that for your deeds the mapper is like that for the physical geography of the world you know whether it's like this adventure site or this trek that we're taking across the continent or whatever and i don't mean necessarily that you have your graph paper and your pencil and you're doing all the five foot square kind of things it, it could be a flow chart it can be words on a page <laughs> that you arrange uh, in a particular order um now i am one of those who likes give me the graph paper all right how many feet is it yes my character is measuring the feet <laughs> you know like <laughs> that is what they are doing it breaks out as cartography supplies and, and yeah. surveyor supplies cartographer's tools are in the fifth edition player's handbook for a reason and it does require you to work with the dm to come to an understanding of like all right when the dm describes the dimensions of something if that's the kind of play that they're going for here is what i need to know about that do for instance you count the square I'm standing in whenever you're giving me distances. <laughs> if there's a corner, uh, it, you know, is there an extra space that you're not mentioning because two of them are coming together and they're like that one uh, section that they intersect with, it, you know, it, it, is that 70 feet away or is it 80 feet away? Those are the kinds of things that I don't mind working out with a player or as a player working out with the DM. This comes from the times that you've uh, the, that you've tried to map where it does seem to frustrate some players that it's not exactly the same as what the dm has yeah <laughs> well i quickly learned that uh, flow charts are much easier um, flow charts are, are much easier I, especially if you've got a dm who's not doing like the full like mega dungeon we're going to be coming back to this location many times uh style of play because then it's more like the flow chart is more like all right, well, we got to get out of here or we, we missed this one branch. Like, let's go check that one out. And you're not going to return to this location after this session. So you don't need a really detailed map. You just need to have an idea of where you're at. Mm -hmm. But if you are running a game where you're returning to the same location over and over and over again, then having a very detailed map, as accurate as you can get it, potentially reveals information to you, right? Like you can tell maybe like, is there a secret room here is there something yeah. in this space you know you get clues about the environment based on what you've discovered and like to me when people say dungeons and dragons is about exploration which there are plenty of people uh make that argument this is what they're talking about i'm literally mapping this place like not just my character me as a person i am exploring it and as i'm exploring it i'm figuring out where are its secrets where does this lead can i get any clues from the layout of this place, especially if you've got a, a dungeon master who puts a lot of work into their dungeon maps where they're interconnected and, and multi-level and, and like these really intricate spaces. They're not just a collection of square rooms and corridors, but something that's like palatial <laughs> and, and labyrinthine. Mm -hmm. As a player, that sends a signal to me as the DM, or sorry, as the DM, it sig sends a signal to me when a player goes, I'm, I really care about this. I care enough to take the time to make a map of it for myself. And it's the same as like the NPC tracker, the chronicler, it is it represents an investment by the player in the world that as a dm is really gonna like keep my spirits up it's gonna be like hell yeah like that's really cool you're really getting into this as such as a dm i will reward that there will be a secret room you're not gonna go through all that work for nothing because that would just be i don't know unfair eventually they're gonna stop doing all that work because there's nothing there so you want to reward that with something yeah your sixth <laughs> empty room with detritus in the corner i mean six um, of them in a row is a bit much but it's okay to have the yeah. occasional empty room oh yeah totally it's it's those are the rooms that they spend 10 minutes just to figure out how to walk across because they're scared by because they're scared room. of it yeah exactly that is the, the point of an empty room is tension you know, it's yeah. like, wait a minute. The last three we've gone through have had traps and weird shit and monsters. Like, why is this one empty? What's <laughs> yeah. wrong with it? Uh, yeah. Doesn't mean it's featureless. Doesn't mean there's nothing in it. It just means there's no monsters or obvious threat. And this is why if you're creating a detailed map, you will be able to see like the layout of like, oh shit, okay, if we post up here, if we have our battle in this room, then that means some of us can come around this corridor through this way and flank them. Or conversely, like we need to make sure they don't do the same to us. And it like 
turns the battlefield from being like, we're going to fight in this one room to like, this battle is going to take place over a series of rooms and mm -hmm. there's going to be movement between them. We're going to try different things. We're going to like try to, to lure them into this place, but some of us are going to be in the opposite side so we can come up behind them. It's hard to do that if you yourself do not have an accurate picture of what this place looks like. Uh, it doesn't have as much direct um, continued help as the, as the others, the Chronicle or the Mapper and everything, but that's the rules lawyer. Someone yeah. that is there to look up rules in those downtimes where they're not doing anything. Maybe they're the fighter, but they like just flipping through the book. I know that was my thing. Mm -hmm. I usually always played fighter, so I had a lot of it had a lot of downtime if I wasn't smashing shit. Yeah. And you know, of course, third edition, we all remember that combat. Um, <laughs> it went on forever. Yeah, and some so time in between it's, rounds. <laughs> it, yeah, it's it's good that when you have that one person at table that always wants to argue that they can do you know three or four things instead of just two, you can have someone the DM just look over y'all look at me and I'd be like already in there flipping the book. There are some players who the dungeon master telling them no provokes a, a, like confrontation. Whereas mm -hmm. if a player goes, nah man, see, we just can't do this. Then it, it kind of diffuses things. It's so if you have a player who's like belligerent, but you still want them around because they're not that bad, it can yeah. kind of smooth things. <laughs> Well, uh, guess what, bro? That that action was peer reviewed. <laughs> yes, it was peer reviewed. No. <laughs> yes, exactly. This is not the kind of annoying, um, you know, disruptive rules lawyer. This isn't the one trying to undermine the DM. This is the DM's assistant, the, the rules yeah. consultant, right? Yeah. You know, they are someone who, when the dungeon master goes, I'm going to make a ruling, but I want you to look that up because next time I want to get it right or I want to get it by the book. Or, mm -hmm. you know, the DM's going like, let me think about this for a minute, but while I'm thinking about it, can someone look up the rule for me? If you've got a player who just habitually never looks up their spells, for whatever reason they cannot uh, seem to do it in between their turn or whatever, then having someone who is really familiar with the spells and where they're at in the book, who doesn't mind just flipping through, um, can be really <laughs> helpful because that person's going to go, all right, I cast this spell. The DM's going to go, all right, well, what's the save? Does it require a save? What about a spell attack? And that player goes, uh, um. <laughs> someone else can go, yeah, it's a wisdom save. I have, uh, I've, so been, I've be... been that person so many times. <laughs> right. <laughs> You know, a lot of people complain about these kinds of players. They'll say, I can't stand the, the player that doesn't look up their spells or the one that always needs to know what the grapple rules are or whatever, less so than fifth and it wasn't third. And just having another player at the table go like, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to mm -hmm. look these things up. Even if you don't ask me to, I'm going to look these up. And like, to me, that's how I learned the rules of a game. I got my rule book open. Another player says they want to do something, cast a spell, do an action or something. I'm going to look it up in the rule book myself because... I want to know. It doesn't matter that it's never going to come up. And because I'm the kind of person who learns by doing rather than just by being taught, it lets me go like, oh, that's what they're doing. That's what this looks like. Yeah, yeah. Really helpful uh, in that regard. Next level stuff for this is the, the player who is familiar enough with the DMG to do the same, but for the DMG. Uh, with a dungeon master who's okay with it, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Monster Mail, nah, that's the, that's the DM's book. Don't even just, why, why ruin the enchantment? Of the moment, I, I, uh, looking up things I, in the monster manual. You know my position on this, Jim. I still don't <laughs> read that shit unless I have to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I will yeah, glance. Yeah. I will glance. The last little one that I, I'd like to, I'd like to, to, to throw in here, to add in here a little bit, uh, if I want to use a pun for it, is the mathematician, the Ooh, person yeah. at the table who actually likes math. And when they, when the <laughs> wizard who hates math rolls a fireball and rolls eight d six and goes, ugh, they can go. Yeah. Yeah, it's thirty two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's something about someone who can do quick uh, addition and subtraction just in their head very fast that can make a lot of this uh, go smoothly. Of course, like now that now they've kind of talked through a lot of this, realize that VTTs take care of much of this, a like lot mapping of this. and you know, all that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I still find that sitting down with real books, real pencils, real paper, not that anybody gets to do much of that these days. Um, yeah. Is like the, the ideal experience for these. And there's... I mean, without risking, or with risking like going off on a wild tangent, VTTs are really fun. They do a lot of things well, much better than pen and paper at your tabletop. But I still find that real, the flesh and blood is what I mm -hmm. want. Your flesh, yes. your blood on the table. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> I, I need it in my body. <laughs> if you like the video, please like, subscribe, and go ahead and ring that bell to get those notifications. 
that Web DM exists thanks to our Patreon patrons, the, the Web, Web Demons. Demons. If you join the Web Demons, you'll get our weekly podcast, show audio, discounts that'll save you way more than $5 a month on books and dice, and so much more. Check out our free podcast episodes right now, including our free interview with Luke Gygax about all things D&D. If you like our advice for your games, then why don't you come check us out and watch us play? Yeah, head on over to our second YouTube channel, WebDM Plays, and subscribe. Thanks for watching. That kind of raises a, a secondary point that's not necessarily related to player roles, but it is sort of a tip, a player tip, which is like rewrite your character occasionally. Like just completely rewrite it, put it on a different new character sheet, new new whatever, oh, yeah. because there is undoubtedly something on that sheet you have forgotten about. And mm -hmm. there is nothing worse than something terrible happening and at the end of the session you're looking over your character going, Well it shit. It was right there. It was right there. Mm -hmm. The answer that I needed was right there. Um, that that happened to me more than yeah. a couple times in my with my later characters when I switched over to the uh, the clear sheets with the dry erase oh, markers. Yeah. Yeah, because I I quit because I quit erasing and having to rewrite my character sheets, uh -huh. and so yeah, there was a couple times with Rovian that I was just like, "Fuck!" <laughs> <laughs> it was right there. Was right I had there. that potion that would have been uh -huh. perfect. Uh -huh. you know? It's one of the reasons when I play, I rewrite my character every time I play, uh, and I just use yeah. a blank sheet of paper. I don't use a character sheet or anything like that, and I just transfer the stuff over because then it's like, well, maybe this session I want things in a different order. Right, like I, if, we're, if it's a combat heavy section, I want all my combat stats in one location. So again, we mm -hmm. can, that's a big tangent. We can come back to the, uh, rein ourselves back in to the main, uh, main topic. Well, yeah, here. I mean, uh, 